I'm uh, Richard Deacon. Uh, this is my studio. Um, I'm an academician. I've been an academician since 98. Almost any material interests me. I've been less interested in mineral-based materials and more interested in, or, uh, in materials which have an organic basis. So cloth, leather, uh, wood, string. Polyester, I don't really like the way it smells. And I don't really like greasy things very much. I think that's an aversion to stickiness. I don't really like sticky things. If you ask me a favorite one, I'd say, well, actually, I like organic materials. Basket making is a technology that I'm interested in because of the weaving uh, and the weaving creating structure, but also that in and out, inside and outside thing. Metal interests me because of uh, um, the way that bending something gives it structure, you know, so you bend something and it becomes strong. Uh, you go round a volume, you don't, have a, you don't have a structure for it. In terms of family history, my father was in the Air Force, but um, my mother was also was a doctor. She joined the Indian Army uh, after she graduated, and uh, they met on the boat going out to India. My father joined the Air Force as a, uh, uh, an apprentice, actually, when he was 14. At the outbreak of war, he was a fully trained bomber pilot. Uh, he never talked about it, I mean, they never do. But I've got his logbooks, and after he died, I could sort of piece together his, his history. He stayed in the Air Force after the end of the war. He joined it as a career rather than as a conscript. In India, he was working with Mountbatten. My mother was then sent off to Malaya to work in a, uh, like a MASH unit, kind of uh, uh, advanced hospital. Uh, and so she saw a lot of the war, in, from the, far more of the things on the Japanese side of the conflict than my father did. And she was always much closer to it. She'd talk more a bit, but, um, but she died when I was quite young, so you know, I, don't, I, I never really got into that conversation with her. My mother kind of went into the, became a kind of Air Force wife. She stopped practicing medicine, except as a locum, after she'd had three children. Uh, although later in life she did uh, start to get back into, the, into it again, although she thought that prevention was better than cure at, uh, at this point, so she was working in a birth control clinic. In 1953, my mother went to the coronation. She came back with two stamp albums, coronation stamp albums, um, which she gave one to me and one to my brother. She'd actually been a stamp collector as well when she was a girl. She's got all the coronation stamps from, of uh, uh, King George V uh, from every single British colony and protectorate. Um, so it's a kind of fantastic picture of uh, um, the British Empire at its kind of maximum extent. Now, stamp collecting is kind of a, uh, an interesting beginning. One thing you start to pick up from uh, uh, stamp collecting is geography. And then uh, there's also a sli another thing to do with pattern, the collecting a set and kind of ar arranging the set on the page. The nice thing about stamp collecting is that it's possibly complete. Uh, it's a, occupying a corner of the world that you can complete, that's finished, that's got kind of, uh, that's got edges. It has uh, attached to it some notion of completeness. I've never tried to make a complete collection. The stamp collecting was the only one where I ever got into an idea of uh, when I realised that completeness was a siren call that, uh, uh, and that if you really became a collector, you'd, uh, it would kind of absorb you completely. But I also collected other things. I collected broken bird's eggs. I also had a collection of butterflies from, uh, uh, from Sri Lanka. Collecting was also some route to an adult conversation in a way that, because I was five years old, to be given the kind of butterfly fauna of Ceylon. Someone's kind of thinking that you can, that you know what to do with this rather than scribbling it. You know, over there there's lots of collections of bits and pieces. The ropes are all made from different fibres, but also just different uh, different stones that I picked up, quite old ones, uh, it's a couple of million years old, a couple of them. It was a box full of uh, circus animals and zoo animals from, uh, uh, that my mother had when she was a child. 
Uh, and so they're on there as well, those kind of uh, early 1920s. And then there's sort of fossils and rocks that are, that are picked up from the beach. And then there's samples of materials or, or samples of ways of a surface might, uh, might behave. So there's a kind of a Marge Simpson head, because I think her hair, her hair is kind of interesting. Tra I was traveling a lot, and so I used to go to toy shops and buy uh, um, toy animals. Sometimes my luggage can get very heavy when I'm coming back from places. In a way, they're reminders or samples or uh, both the futility and the satisfaction of collecting. We're at Duxford in the Imperial War Museum in their airspace hangar. And we're looking at their collection of aircraft. My father was in the Air Force. Um, and he piloted really many, many different kinds of aircraft. The Sunderland behind us was one of the ones uh, that he loved best of all. He liked sailing, he liked being on the sea, he liked flying, so you know, what's, what's not to like about an aircraft that's also a boat? The Sunderland, because obviously it floats like a boat, it has this kind of beautiful outside skin. Um, and if you look at the way the Sunderland is built, with that kind of uh, uh, incredible riveting of the, uh, of the sections, I mean, all, all of that's very uh, um, evocative or redolent uh, to me. This is a set of slides that I found, uh, again, after my father had died in his papers. It was to do with the uh, uh, NATO uh, and the containment of the Soviet threat. So this is... 1963, so it's post-Cuban Missile Crisis. They're quite chilling slides because they are a strategy for a nuclear war. This talk is really about articulating a rationale for that strategy, although the uh, underlying rationale is, de uh, is deterrence rather than usage. And, uh, and I kind of think that that Cold War situation particularly in the early 60s, was quite scary. The threat was quite ramped up. The imminent possibility of destruction of a nuclear war was, uh, uh, was kind of quite sort of present in the back of your mind, even as a teenager. The graphics are good. The graphics are, in a funny way, very uh, Soviet the, on some of them, very, or very Russian constructivist graphics. The whole thing about that Cold War was about kind of posture not pretense so much, supported by credible hardware in, in some ways. It's kind of secret but public at the same time. Peter Sellers says it very well when they're talking about the doomsday weapon. He says there's no point in building, in having a thing like that, if you don't let other people know that you have it. If nobody knows you've got it, you might have to use it. It's very carefully worked out, that kind of, the, the whole deterrent strategy. And that was the environment that we, that we grew up in. Is that a bomber, Dad? Yes, I think it is. What's it doing? Oh, just flying around.